Welcome to the Biblical Institute and welcome to the book of Hosea. Hosea is probably um, one of the Old Testament books, or at least among the prophets, that is most often read. At least the first chapter, maybe the first three chapters, are a, um, a, a, an account that um, people are generally familiar with because of the strange thing that God asked the prophet Hosea to do. The book of Hosea is quite long, 14 chapters, and therefore I'm going to divide this into two sections. This section uh, is going to deal primarily with background information about the book, and then in the next session we'll go into more of a verse-by-verse -verse breakdown of the outline of the book and exactly what the message is that Hosea is proclaiming. I'm going to give a little bit of the message today, but, but it's going to be um, not a verse-by-verse chronological study of the book, and we'll get to that in session two. Let me begin with the author and the date. Hosea was the son of Beiri, according to Hosea 1.1. He prophesied about the middle of the 8th century, and his ministry um, began or was during or shortly after the time of Amos. Um, most people think that Amos was the first of the minor prophets, writing prophets, um, and Hosea would have been the second most likely. Um, Amos threatened God's judgment on Israel at the hands of an unnamed enemy. Hosea takes us a step further and identifies the enemy as Assyria. We don't know if Amos knew who the enemy was, but we would assume, or I would assume, that had Hosea written first, that Amos would have then been aware that Assyria was going to be the enemy. But because Hosea uh, mentions the enemy and Amos does not, makes me think that, that um, Amos is the first um, to write and then Hosea came along. Judging from the kings that are mentioned in Hosea 1.1, and I hope that you've taken time to read through this prophet um, before this study begins, but judging from the kings mentioned in 1.1, Hosea must have prophesied for about 38 years. And even though he's listed as a minor prophet, um, he had a very long prophetic time, and his book is quite lengthy as well, being 14 chapters long. Though, um, you know what? We, we, we know almost absolutely nothing about him from any source outside of the book. There just is nothing extra biblical out there for us. He was the only one of the writing prophets to come from the northern kingdom of Israel. And his prophecy primarily directed to that kingdom. But since the prophetic activity is dated by reference to the kings of Judah, it would seem that the book may have been written in Judah after the fall of Samaria, the northern capital, and the northern kingdom. That happened in the year 722-721 B.C., and, and, um, and, and so th there are many references uh, to that throughout uh, the book in chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 5, 6, 10, 11, 12, many references to the fall. And so it would seem likely that he probably went south and wrote his oracle after that event took place. The book of Hosea stands first in the division of, of the Bible called the Book of the Twelve, okay? So in our English Bible, um, it is not the first one, but in the Jewish Book of Twelve, it is the first one. Um, and, and the first one of the Minor Prophets are the Book of Twelve. And, um, and again, remember that they are not called Minor Prophets because uh, they are insignificant. They're called minor prophets, generally speaking, because of the brevity of their books, especially compared to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. So some background on Hosea. Hosea lived in tragic um, and, and, uh, tragic and, and final days of the northern kingdom. Um, during that period of time, in, in the final days, the final years of the northern kingdom, um, six kings reigned within about a 25-year period. So we have Jeroboam II, 
and and he's kind of the last major king and then we have this series of six kings that come and go quite rapidly four of them kings Zechariah, shalom pekahiah and pekka were murdered by their successors while they were in office and one hoshia was captured in battle only one menahem was succeeded on the throne by his son so these kings given to Israel by God according to chapter 13 and verse 11 in anger and taken away in wrath. This is God's judgment upon this northern kingdom because of their sins. And, um, and Hosea tells us that these kings floated away like twigs on the surface of the water in chapter uh, 10, I think it is. And, and, um, and, and so, we have a lot of bloodshed followed by bloodshed followed by bloodshed for the northern kingdom. Assyria, the great kingdom of Assyria that started out over in Mesopotamia, was expanding westward. And remember, Syria was straight north of Israel, but Assyria captured, conquered Assyria. Um, uh, Syria, and so now they have expanded into that area. Menahem uh, accepted when he was king uh, the world power of Assyria as his overlord, and he paid tribute to them. But shortly afterwards, in 733 BC, Israel was dismembered by Assyria because of the intrigue of Pekah, who had gained Israel's throne by killing Pekahiah and Menachem's son and successor, and, and only the territories then of Ephraim and western Manasseh were left to the king of Israel. So Ephraim was in the far north, western Manasseh um, was on the other side of the Jordan, and that's the only thing that was left for the northern kingdom at this point. Then, because of the disloyalty of Hoshea or Hoshea, uh, Pekah's successor, um, Samaria was captured and its people were exiled in 722 and 721, bringing the northern kingdom to an end and still an end to this very day. So what's the theological theme and message of the book of Hosea? Well, the first part of the book, Chapters 1, 2, and 3 narrates the family line of Hosea as a, a symbol uh, similar to the symbolism uh, in the lives of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel to convey, convey the message the prophet had from the Lord for his own people. Don't misunderstand. This is not symbolic. This is not allegory. But God is using the real events in the life of Hosea, his wayward wife, and the names of his children as symbolic for the nation of Israel and their waywardness and the crimes that they had committed. God ordered Hosea to marry an adulterous wife, Gomer, and their three children were each given a symbolic name representing part of of the ominous message. So we have that in chapter one. Chapter two alternates between Hosea's relation to Gomer and its symbolic representation of God's relation to Israel. So when we go through that, we're gonna see that we're kind of bouncing back and forth. This is going on in Hosea's life. This is going on in the nation of Israel and they balance between the two of them. The children are told um, uh, to drive their unfaithful mother out of the house, but it was it was um, her reform that was the end goal, not her riddance. That's what Hosea sought. That's what God sought: the reform of His people, the repentance of His people, the return of His people, not the riddance of His people. And so the prophet was ordered to continue loving her, and he took her back. And he kept her um, in isolation for a while. Chapter 3. The affair graphically represents the Lord's relation to the Israelites. We see that in chapter 2. And I can't wait to get to chapter 3 because chapter 3 is so short but has such a, um, a glorious message to it. We'll take a look at that soon. 
but um, but but the, these repre- these this relationship between um, Hosea and Gomer um, represent God and the Israelites who had been disloyal to him by worshiping Canaanite deities as the source of their abundance. Um, Israel was to go through a period of exile and the Lord still loved Israel during that time. They are his covenant people. God established an eternal covenant with the nation, with the people of Israel. And I'm talking about Israel as a whole, all 12 tribes. So the fact that the northern kingdom was carried away by the Assyrians and have disappeared from our obvious sight does not mean that they have disappeared from God's heart or from God's covenant. The Lord still loves his covenant people and he longs to take them back just as Hosea took back Gomer. The return of God's people to him is described with imagery recalling the exodus from Egypt and settlement in Canaan. Hosea saw Um, Israel's past experiences with the Lord as the fundamental pattern or type of God's future dealings with his people. The Bible tells us in Romans, especially chapter 10, that Israel will one day return to God and God will open his heart and accept them back and one day all Israel will be saved. So the first part of the book is the first three chapters. The second part of the book, chapters 4 to 14, give the details of Israel's involvement in Canaanite religion. But but a a systematic outline of the book um, is a little bit difficult to to grasp a hold of, okay? Um, other, Other of the minor prophets were very, very systematic, not so with Hosea. And and like other prophetic books, Hosea... um, he issued a call to the people to repent. Israel's alternate to destruction was was to forsake her idols and return to the Lord. That's what chapter 6 and chapter 14 are all about. Forsake the idols. Forsake the one that you're lusting after, the the false ones, and come back to your true love, come back to God. Now, information gained from materials discovered Uh, dating back to the 15th century, enables us to know know more clearly uh, the religious practices against which Hosea protested. He saw the the, the failure um, to acknowledge God as, as Israel's basic problem. The failure to acknowledge God as Israel's basic problem. God established the nation of Israel, the family, of Abraham as his chosen people. God longed to bless his family, to bless the kings, to bless the nation, to bless the people, to bless the fruit, the crops, the fields, the animals, the flocks. But Israel essentially fell apart. Why did they fall apart? Well, Hosea tells us, here's the reason because you have failed to acknowledge God as your God. God's relation to Israel was that of love, the intimacy of the covenant, a relationship between God and Israel, illustrated in the first part of the book by the husband and wife relationship, is later amplified by a father-child relationship. Disloyalty to God was spiritual adultery. Israel had turned to Baal worship and had sacrificed at the pagan high places, which included associating with the sacred prostitutes at the sanctuaries and worshiping the calf images at Samaria. There was also international intrigue. God had told his people, stay away. Stay away from the gods. Stay away from intermarrying. Stay away from these people. Be, come out. I brought you out. Come out and be separate. Be unique. Be peculiar. Be my people. But there was this international intrigue and materialism, lusting after the things, the gods, and the wealth of the other nations. God would, would have given them wealth and did give them wealth. 
but they gave credit to it to false gods. Yet despite God's condemnation and the harshness of language with which the unavoidable judgment was announced, the major purpose of the book of Hosea is to proclaim God's compassion and God's covenant love. And finally, Israel, lusting after everything but Yahweh. Israel was going to pay the price, but God's covenant love cannot let go eternally, but it can let go temporarily, and that's what we see. Now, there's a couple of special problems in the book of um of Hosea. And I'm not going to go into detail. If we were in a seminary class, we would go into a lengthy detail on the problems of all of the minor prophets, and I don't really like dealing with those. Um, but the book of Hosea has at least two perplexing problems. I don't see either of them as a real problem at all. But the first concerns the nature of the story uh, told in chapters 1 through 3 and the character of Gomer. Some interpreters have thought that the story was merely allegorical of the relation between God and Israel because God would never have one of his chosen prophets go and marry a prostitute, an unfaithful woman. Well, I happen to know that God did because I believe the book. I believe the word. I believe that it is literal. And, and um, it, is, it is allegorical um, in that it is describing the relationship between God and Israel, Israel and God, but it is literal in what it is telling us about Hosea and Gomer and the children that they had. So, um, so there are those that think it's allegorical. There are those that think it's literal. I'm among the literal ones and among the latter, the literal people. Some insist then that Gomer was faithful at first and later became unfaithful. Um, and I guess, again, even the literalists have a problem with God telling Hosea to take a prostitute as his wife. I don't have a problem with that. Um, God calls you and me, sinful people, to be the bride of Christ. He doesn't go out and find the pure, the holy, the perfect, the righteous. He finds the broken, the scarred the wrinkled, the sinful. The, the second problem with the book is the relationship between chapter 3 and chapter 1. Um, again, I don't see a big problem with that, and when we get to it, you, you'll see for yourself. But despite the fact that no children are mentioned in chapter 3, children were mentioned in chapter 1, no children are mentioned in chapter 3, but we're going to see that chapter 3 has a very special purpose to it. But some interpreters claim that the two chapters are different accounts of the same episode or, or different allegories, as it were, of the same episode. The traditional interpretation, however, is, is more likely that chapter 3 is a sequel to chapter 1. We, we've already laid out the information that we have in chapter 1, and chapter 3 is kind of a sequel and kind of a conclusion to that first part of the book. Um, Hosea was instructed to take her back. So that's our, um, a little bit of our introduction. I have more material that I really want to go into, and it's going to take me a little bit of time. I'll try not to uh, belabor it too much. But the study of the book of Isaiah, I think, is very, very timely uh, for the people of, of God in the 21st century. The condition of the churches today is, I believe, similar to that in Israel in the middle of the 8th century BC. Israel had become uh, conformed to her cultural environment and had adulterated Yahwehism with the cultic practices of the religion of the Canaanites, hoping to secure blessing of fertility and productivity. What God had promised he would do for them. The details may be different, but the reality of what has taken place in the church today is similar. I think the prostitution of the church to materialism and to pragmatic religion, to what produces results, well, this has got to be the right thing if your church grows. This has got to be the right thing if your 
church has plenty of income, if your church is wealthy. This has to be the right thing. If, if the parking lot is filled, okay, if we have a glorious uh, church building, an expanding campus, we've, we've pragmatized our faith, our religion, and, and we've looked at results and said, results tell us that we're doing the right thing. John the Baptist did the right thing, got his head cut off. Jesus did the right thing, he was crucified. Paul did the right thing and was killed in Rome. Peter did the right thing and was crucified upside down. So the right thing does not always equal the, the, the anticipated outcome of things, okay? And, and so, um, it's firmly believed, I think, that I firmly believe, I should say, that the person who takes seriously the opportunity to read the message of Hosea will find um, their efforts relevant but difficult, as did the prophet. There are two unequal sections, as I've already said in the book of Hosea, composed of chapters 1 to 3 and then 4 to 14. The theme of the first becomes the constant reoccurring refrain in the second part of the book. Israel's unfaithfulness to the covenant relationship with Yahweh, the tragedy which Hosea experienced in his own marriage, becomes a paradigm of the national experience. And as paradigm, it must not be allowed to overshadow the deeper tragedy of a faithless people forsaking their God. And so, I want to talk about um, the kind of the outline in a very general sense of the book of Hosea. And I'm not going to go through this slowly. We're going to go more slowly in the second half of this, but I'm kind of giving an overview at this particular point. But the very first thing that we see is a broken marriage and a chastened wife in chapters 1 through 3. So number one, we see the wife of harlotry. It says in chapter 1, verses 2 to 9, um, um, the, the prophet's personal tragedy was Israel's apostasy and punishment. The present character and future punishment of Israel are symbolized by the unfaithfulness of Gomer and the, the names of her children. And, and so we're going to see that begin to unfold. Now, with that in mind, there are, um, the, we, we have a child that is born. And if, if you have your Bible and your Bible is open, it says um, uh, in verse 2, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go take yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Dipleam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel. Jezreel. Wow, Jezreel. Have we ever heard that before? You know, there's, there's numerous places of significance in the Old Testament. And one of them, especially important for this time period, is, is mentioned right here in the book by the name of this child, Jezreel. The city was situated south of the city of or village of Nain that uh, is talked about in Luke um, and would be um, uh, the, the Nain, where Nain, Jesus would be during his ministry, okay, very close to this. It was near Mount Gilboa where the Philistines defeated Israel and where King Saul lost his life. It was also where Saul's son, Ishbosheth, who was crowned king, but that didn't last because God had chosen David. It was the royal residence of King Ahab and the site of Naboth's vineyard. Read all about it in 1 Kings chapter 21. In 1 Kings 21 and 22, we see that, that this was the site, Jezreel was the site of the prophecy of the end of Ahab's reign. Um, it was the site of the death of his wife. It was the place of the death of his son. Um, it was at the house of Ahab that where um, it, it was... It was the house of Ahab, where, where, where Ahab was killed, was in Jezreel. Okay? It was a place of judgment. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Things came to an end in Jezreel. But Jezreel is mentioned only by the prophet Hosea. The name means God sows. And so for Israel, Jezreel was really two things. 
Number one, it was a place of judgment. Hosea 8, 7. Hosea, uh, let, let me read actually Hosea 1, 4 to 5. And it says, Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Okay, so it was a place of judgment. But the second thing is that for God, for, for Israel it was a place of judgment, but for God it was a place of planting. New life, new growth, new opportunity. Hosea 2, 19 to 22. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. In that day, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies and they will respond to the earth and the earth will respond to the grain and the new wine and the oil and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. Or in Hebrew, lo ruhamah, another of the children's names. I will say to those called, not my people, or in Hebrew, lo ami, another of the children's names, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. So, so we see Jezreel was a place of judgment, but it was also a place of new beginning. God said, one day there's going to be a new beginning for you. The ministry of Hosea covers an extensive period, as I said earlier. The southern kings during his ministry are Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. The northern king was Jeroboam II, which places Hosea's work sometime between 793 and 753. Jeroboam was the last great monarch of the north. After his death, there are six kings that serve over a period of about 30 years in Israel's history. Um, we almost know nothing about Hosea's life. His father was Beeri. We, we don't know who that was. Um, we know that Hosea was not married when we meet him. He may have been a young man when he was called into ministry, though his message was both to the north and to the south. The mention is primarily to the north. The book of Hosea actually has three sections. I've alluded to two, but there's really three. Um, first, there's chapters 1 to 3, which talk about God's relationship with Israel, and it's like a husband and an unfaithful wife. But God is going to make that relationship flourish. The second part of the book is chapters 4 through 10. And it deals with Hosea's unfaithfulness um, um, being described there in quite extensive detail. But God will make Israel flourish one day. The third part is chapters 11 through 14. And God's relationship is like that of a father with a rebellious child. But God will make that relationship flourish. So what's the message of Hosea? Well, there are several messages. Message number one is the message of the unfaithful wife, okay? And that first message, um, well, actually, let me say, um, it, it's summed up in two figures. That first message is summed up in two figures, the unfaithful wife and the rebellious child. Um, the, the first one is the unfaithful wife. Hosea took Gomer, Gomer to be his wife. He knew what she was. He knew her background. He loved her anyway. She was true to her heritage. She was unfaithful and bore children, not Hosea's. All she bore to him were children of others. That's what chapter 2 tells us. Hosea gave her gifts. He provided for her. He took care of her, just like God takes care of Israel. But she, Gomer, attributed the gifts to others, just like Israel was attributing all that they had to Baal. But Hosea was determined to change her and to bring her back. I read in chapter 2, uh, verses 14, 15, 19, and 20, Therefore I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. 
There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor. Achor means trouble. As in the days of her youth, as in the days she came up out of Egypt, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and in justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. You see, Hosea is telling us that one day there would be blessing for Israel, fruitfulness for Israel. Against all reason, Hosea took Gomer back. Against all reason, the day is coming when God will take Israel back. So we have the unfaithful wife, then we have the unfaithful child, okay? Now, now, Hosea was called to be a son of God, but, um, and, and Hosea's child was called to be a son of God, and, and as Israel was called to be a son of God, but Israel was determined to rebel. Um, and, and Israel was determined, number one, to rebel, number two, uh, to not accept God as their God, but God would not give up his unfaithful child. In chapter 11, and chapter 11 brings out all three of these points. Israel's determination to rebel, chapter 11, verses 2 and 7. Um, um, Israel's um, refusal to acknowledge God, chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. God not being willing to give up Israel, chapter 11, verses 8 to 11. And it says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like um, Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger. Nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion, but when he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria. I will assemble them in their homes, declares the Lord. God is going to bring Israel back. Uh, who on earth are Adma and Zeboim? Well, actually, if you remember, when Lot moved to Sodom and Gomorrah, there were several cities that were destroyed by um, fire and brimstone, and Adama and Zeboim are two of those cities. So think Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, can I treat you like Sodom and Gomorrah, basically is what he's saying. No, I'm not going to destroy you. I'm going to bring you back. This is God. This is our God. One who continues to love, despite everything. So message number two, message number one, okay, basically is the message of the rebellion of the nation. Message number two is um, religious life will not save you. Being religious doesn't save you. I think that's where the church is today. I think the modern church as a whole is a religious institution that somehow thinks the fact that they go to church, they give a little bit of money, they take communion, they get baptized, they do all these things. That's their salvation. See, Israel was plenty religious. Israel had celebrations every year. And they kept them. Even though they were worshiping Baal, Israel kept their yearly festivals, their annual celebrations, their new moons, their Sabbath days, their appointed feasts. And yet Hosea says, you are joined, in the middle of that, you're joined to your idols. In the middle of your worship, alleged worship of Yahweh, you're intent on pursuing your idols. And you're even making idols for yourself and calling them your gods. Hosea 6, 1 to 4. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, 
he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that just disappears. So, message number two, being religious isn't going to save you. Message number three is God characterizes the unfaithfulness of Israel as adultery. Adultery. Hosea is the first prophet to describe Israel's relationship with God as a marriage. In, in fact, only one other prophet, Jeremiah, mentions unfaithfulness more, in, in terms of adultery more than Hosea. Um, Hosea mentions it eight times. Jeremiah mentions it nine times. But, but Hosea is the first prophet to view the relationship between Yahweh and Israel as a marriage relationship. The adultery is seen in her going after, lusting after, chasing after, desiring after other gods, false idols. The worship of the Lord is not, monothe not just monotheistic, folks. The worship of the Lord is God-specific. Yahweh-specific. God is not interested in just people that are monotheistic. God wants people to recognize him and him alone as their God. And so, Hosea reminds Israel that their God, their true God, is the God that brought them out of Egypt. In chapter 11 and chapter 13, Hosea says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. But her adultery is seen in, in so many ways. Okay, Her adultery, this, this third message um, that, that um, the relationship between God and Israel is characterized by adultery, um, number one, it's seen in the fact that, that Isaiah describes a relationship as a marriage. Number two, that adultery is seen in her going after other gods. Number three, um, Israel becomes uh, dependent on other gods for her own security. Chapter 5, verse 13. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores, then Ephraim turned to Assyria and sent to the great king for help. But he was not able to cure your, not able to heal your sores. In their turmoil, in their hurt, in their pending doom, they say, well, Assyria, is the answer to our problem. In chapter 7, verses 18 to 13, I won't read the whole thing, I don't think. It says, Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is like a flat cake not turned over. Foreigners sap his strength, and he doesn't even realize it. His hair is sprinkled with grain, he doesn't even notice. Israel's arrogance testifies against him despite all this. He does not return to the Lord his God, or even search for him. Wow. In Hosea 6, 8 and 9, we read, Israel is swallowed up. Now she's among the nations like a worthless thing. For they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has sold herself to lovers. And then in chapter 12, we read that Ephraim feeds on the wind. He pursues the east wind all day and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Assyria and sends olive oil to Egypt. So it's seen in their dependence on others. It's also their adultery is seen in, in how they view their prosperity. Chapter 7, verse 14. They do not cry out to me from their hearts, but wail upon their beds. They gather together, 
grain and new wine, but they turn away from me. God has been producing their crop, but they're giving credit to Baal. Chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Do not rejoice, O Israel. Do not be jubilant like the other nations, for you have been unfaithful to your God. You love the wages of a prostitute at every threshing floor. Threshing floors and wine presses won't feed the prophets, won't feed the people, and the new wine will fail them. So their adultery is also seen in that they don't even look to God. Um, chapter 4. Verse 1 and following, Hear the word, Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness. There is no love. There is no acknowledgement of God in the land. It's also their, un, their adulterous nature is seen in their um, lifestyle. Chapter 4, again, um, verse 2, there is only cursing. Lying, murder, stealing, adultery. They break all bounds. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. And because of this, the land mourns. And all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea are dying. Chapter 6, verse 8, Gilead is a city of wicked men, stained with footprints of blood. As marauders lie in ambush for a man, so do bands of priests. They murder on the road to Sheshem, committing shameful crimes. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. So message number three in the book is that, um, that God will punish the people. God will punish and by the way, that punishment is going to be horrible and it's going to be inescapable. Isaiah speaks much to the horror of this and I'm not going to take time to, at this point to go through all the verses. But, but in, in Hosea um, uh, chapter 9, verses 15 to 17, because of all their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there. Verse 17, my God will reject them because they have not obeyed him. Chapter 10, verse 13, but you have planted wickedness. You've reaped evil. You have eaten the full fruit of deception because you have depended on your own strength and on your many warriors. The roar of battle will rise against the people. This is how horrible it will be so that you and your fortresses are going to be devastated. Devastated. Mothers will be dashed to the ground with children. This will happen to you, O Bethel, because your wickedness is great. When that day dawns, the king of Israel will be completely destroyed. Chapter 13, um, verse 7, I will come on them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk by the path. Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. Chapter 13, verse 16, the people of Samaria will bear the guilt because they have rebelled against their God, they will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground. Their pregnant women will be ripped open. Wow, God is describing a horrible, horrible punishment that will come on the nation. And Assyria brought that upon Israel. So it's going to be horrible, but number two, it's going to be inescapable. Um, it says in, in chapter 9 and chapter 10, both chapters we read, um, what will you do on the day of your appointed feast, on the day, your festival days of the Lord? Um, even if they escape from destruction, Egypt will gather them, Memphis will bury them, their treasures of silver will be taken by the briars, thorns will overrun their tents. It's inescapable. The days of punishment are coming. The days of reckoning are at hand. Let Israel know this because your sins are so many and your hostility so great the prophet is considered a fool, the inspired man a maniac. The prophet, prophet along with God is the watchtower over Ephraim or the prophet is the watchtower of Ephraim would be another way to read that verse. Um, yet snares await him on all the paths and hostility in the house of his God. 
They have sunk deep into corruption. As in the days of Gibeah, God will remember their wickedness and will punish for them their sins. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your fathers, it was like seeing the early fruit on a fig tree. But when they came to Baal Peor, or Baal Peor, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. Ephraim's glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they rear children, I will bereave them of every one. Woe to them when I turn away from them. I have seen Ephraim, like Tyre, planted in a pleasant base, place. But Ephraim will bring out their children to the slayer and punish them for their sins. Ephraim is blighted. Their root is withered. They yield no fruit. Even if they bear children, I will slay their cherished offspring. Well, let's not despair, because in chapter 14, when we end the book, and we'll get to that in the next session, we're going to find out that God is not planning on wiping them out. We've already read some of those verses. God isn't going to treat you like the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. Hellfire and brimstone is not going to destroy you from the face of the earth so that you are no more. To this very day, Israel is in exile spread all over the earth. Every tribe, nation, language, tongue. But God will call out his people one day. God will redeem his people and God will bring them home. A reoccurring message in the prophets. So let me conclude with just three quick things. The book reminds us that God calls us to a single-minded devotion that trusts and obeys him, his word, his laws, always. God is a jealous God. God wants us. He wants all of us. He wants, he will not share us with the gods of materialism, the gods of wealth, the gods that would steal our time, the guys, gods that would distract us from loving him. God calls us to single-minded devotion. That's what Hosea is about. Number two, anything less than that, single-minded devotion, is adultery. Prostituting oneself. Lusting after another lover. God warns us I believe, against modern-day adultery. Not just sexual, but spiritual adultery, lusting after the gods of this world. So God calls us a single-minded devotion. Anything less than that is prostitution, is adultery. And number three, God will punish the unrepentant. But those who return to him God will bring back. Next session, we'll jump into the book and go verse by verse as best as we can. It's 14 chapters, but I'll point out some of the highlights as we go through that. Hope to see you then.